Now, the government has laid strict measures for the opening of restaurants after several weeks of closure due to corona, the coronavirus pandemic. In his daily update on the pandemic in the country on Monday, the CS Health uh, CS for Health, Mutai Kagwe said restaurants will be cleared to reopen and will operate between 5 a.m. and 4 p.m. and they must limit the number of customers. According to the CS, there will be no self-service and 10 square meters for four people will have to be maintained. According to the laid guidelines, alcohol shall only be sold with a meal in the restaurant and only to be served to customers waiting to be served a meal during the meal or 30 minutes after the meal has ended. Now, I don't know how I feel about this just yet. I, I don't know if we're in... What, what are your thoughts, Mr. Anshari? Because for me, I feel, is this premature? Yeah, yeah, I think it's too early. It's totally mistaken. It's not okay. It's not all right. Mm. And I think they're playing with uh, the same, same fire they were warning Kenyans to, not to play with. Uh, if you watch places where the virus has hit so hard, like uh, Spain, Italy, and the United States, they are very, very cautious. They are not doing what we're trying to do. Mm -hmm. And you realize the, uh, the food industry is one of the riskiest when it comes to transmission of uh, uh, pathogens, bacteria, yeah. viruses, and whatever. So they shouldn't do that. So yeah. my advice to Kenyans is even as the, as the government wants to allow uh, you know, restaurants to open, they should just stay away. Right. And yeah. I know our economy is struggling. I know that a lot of people need their jobs back. But yeah. I, a part of me also really wonders if this is the one to prioritize. Because I also, of course, there are families dependent on these salaries. But I'm still wondering about things like just food provision and basic necessities in Mashinani areas. And, you know, how those priorities balance is, is something that I'm personally really struggling with. Um, so, you know, as we look to reopen, what would be some of the areas that you would say would be the most critical for government to be focusing on, if well, not opening restaurants? Mm, I think for the next like uh, three weeks, of course, the extension the president gave, that should be uh, what we've always had, where you know businesses are closed, like restaurants, so as to see the direction of you know the infections and all that. Yeah. Because I think I don't think we've been doing a good job at what uh, we call contact tracing and. Uh, blocking the whole idea of uh, transmission of the virus because what you've seen is actually a very very consistent number uh, figure like between uh, eight and fifteen of new cases. Yeah, and it's almost like every day or every other yeah. day. I mean, so now which means we're up to. I think yesterday they said it's eleven more cases or yeah. something like that. And now yeah. we're at three eighty something, almost yeah. four hundred. So it goes from eight to twelve, then back to eight like that. So it yeah. means we're not doing a good job at. Uh, tracing contacts and uh, stopping the whole idea of transmission. So we don't need, uh, we don't, I don't think we need to actually move to open uh, uh, such places. And yeah. I think the government is trying to do that because of uh, their, let me say, unwillingness to send money to people who need the money for this duration. Because when you look at places like the U.S., because businesses were closed, guys were given money. There were checks sent to uh, citizens, like yeah. $1,200. So the government should be able to do that for, you know, um, some people in the economy, like guys who work in salons and barber shops and all that. But because we don't want to do that, we want to allow them to go back to work so wow. as to ease the pressure. But oh we, don't, we, should not, we should not do that. Let me know what you guys think about this. Atakama rest restaurants in Afunguliwa, would you, would you go and eat in a restaurant? Because already you've been able to take out from a restaurant, if at all you have to eat from a restaurant. Yes. Or would you go and sit down in a restaurant <laughs> and eat there? Um, and do you, agree, do you agree with that government decision there? Double two triple nine is the SMS line. Please also send your feedback and your comments to our Facebook page at Switch TV Kenya. We're going to take a break, but when we come back, uh, I'll still be here with Mr. Onchari as we talk about um, some more measures, including uh, Kenyan scientists finding an HIV drug to be taken yearly. All right, that's coming up next, as well as those allegations of coronavirus to be tested in Kenya. Hmm. We're going to take a look at that story as well. Stay tuned.
Alright guys, welcome back to the show. This is Full Circle with Joyce and I'm here with my guest Mr. Onchari Oyeye who's the director of uh, the Research Center for African Progress. Karibu Tana to the show. Yes, now, uh, just before the break, we were talking about the government, the Kenyan government's measures to reopen restaurants. I'm asking you guys for your opinions on that and what you think, if that's a good move, if that's the right priority at this point or not. I know a lot of economies abroad are also beginning to give different guidelines as far as um, reopening measures, but they've also done a lot more tests, right? Yeah, they've also yeah. been able to have better systems of contact tracing and whatnot. And it still does not diminish, you know, the the magnitude of the problem yeah. um, that there is. But uh, there recently were, was a BBC report that pointed to a British scientist picking uh, Kenya as one of the places to start uh, tests of COVID-19 trials in Kenya if tests in the UK don't get the expected results. However, President Uhuru Kenyatta has dismissed those plans by UK-based researchers to launch the vaccine trial test here in Kenya. The vaccine was developed by a team of a team rather at Oxford University. Sarah Gilbert, professor of vaccinology at the Jenner Institute, led the preclinical research. The first human trial of a coronavirus vaccine um, began on Thursday in Europe. And of course, Kenyans were up at arms at this. I mean, no one wants to hear that they're a guinea pig for something that's sort of <laughs> like, OK, it failed over there. Let's try it here. Um, do, you, do you think like, uh, was there any sort of reasoning like that you think was appropriate behind that suggestion? Yes, I think it's totally appropriate. Look, uh, we have a virus and it's in circulation. It's gone all over the world. I don't think there is a place, a country, a territory, a territory at the moment that it doesn't have a case of coronavirus. Mm -hmm. And the rest of the world is working very, very hard. You realize we spend a lot of time begging for help from Europe. S Italy, which is in uh, problems right now, Spain, the United States, the UK. That is what we keep on doing every single day. When we have a problem, we ask for help. Yeah. And as a continent, as a people, we need to be able to participate in uh, solving problems. So if we've not played any role in the you know research leading to the development of the drug then we should be able to volunteer in uh, testing mm. they're not coming here to just get all of people forcefully and then begin to you know test the uh, the drug on you you will have to volunteer guys i've done that in the uk i saw that you guys are volunteering in the us it's not a, a big deal we okay. have to play a role in coming up with solutions we can't just keep on lying back and expecting people to do things for us okay. we have to grow up and take care of our business we so have to participate. So speaking of that, uh, yes. um, how would you assess how Kemri has been doing so far, right? They're sort of like our research agency, yeah. medical... There's uh, a there's a portion of people uh, at Kemri who have a lot of experience and they have a lot of ability. But the problem is funding. The other day you saw uh, the lead uh, research guy called uh, Lutomia mm -hmm. being fired because of allegedly not forwarding results at the right time. But of course we know what happened. He complained of the lack of funding. Money is coming from uh, agencies like uh, the World Bank and the instructions send money to Cambridge to allow you guys to even get uh, locally made testing kits. Mm -hmm. And the guy said, give us the money because we have the ability to do that. And he's being fired. So we cannot make progress because we just mediocre in the kind of decisions we make. So wow. the whole idea of Kenyans participating in um, a, a vaccine te testing is okay. Mm. Yes, y because it's voluntary. At the end of the day, someone somewhere is going to volunteer and, the, it's, and it's going to be done. And most of the time when a people volunteer in the testing, they get a priority when the drug is uh, eventually out. out. So it's, it's, it's totally fine. But you so see, because of pressure, mm -hmm. the president rushed to make a decision which is totally unwise. Oh, so you think it was an yes. unwise decision? Yes, that is it. In scientific development, people have to be willing to participate. It doesn't well, mean that we've become guinea pigs. I think the premise was it was coming off like as if, you know, we're just like the, we get the bakshish. <laughs> like no. it failed here, and so now let's try it, you know, on these Kenyans. Remember, if it's been done there and it's not worked, it's, uh, and they want to bring it, it's not because of uh, Africans being less of human beings or anything. It's about differences in ge the genetic code. Mm. It might not work there, but then you realize it's working here. Okay. Yeah. So you think he sort of stepped ahead yeah. of himself? Yeah. The, the first suggestion, which was made in France, was the one which was, of course, uh, w made with a bit of condensation, which that was not okay. Because I think it was presented like Africa is the place where it has to be done because maybe they don't have um, systems mm -hmm. and they've not made progress to where we are. So let's find out whether it can work there. But from the UK, I think the suggestion was okay. We'll do it here. If it doesn't work, we move to other places where there's a difference maybe in uh, 
the ge genetic code. Okay. Yes. Well, before we move back to Corona, let's talk about, you know, uh, Kenyans actually doing something and trying to come up with their own solutions. Professors Benson Edagwa and Howard Gedelman, uh, Gedelman have a, already tested the new drug on mice. This is about an HIV drug that would be taken then yearly. They've tested it on mice and non-human primates and found it safe and effective. The new product has the potential to eliminate complications that arise from missing the doses. The discovery means people living with HIV will not have to take drugs daily as is the case at the moment. The new pill, according to scientists, could also act as a vaccine for healthy people who take it and have unprotected sex. It's, however, not a cure for HIV AIDS. Hmm. So it's nice to see a Kenyan, I guess, taking part in, 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 <laughs> in this, as you're saying. But clearly, there's a tremendous gap as far as our health care is concerned um, and, and provision of, of resources, funding, technology, and know-how. Just the other day, was it in Senegal? We saw how they were being praised for coming up with a, is it a $1 yeah, yeah, testing uh, kit? For COVID-19, and, and it's working. It's working wonders. You realize the economy is much, much weaker than what we have here. Absolutely. So our biggest issue has been uh, lack of leadership, which we still have, we're struggling with that, and corruption. Mm. Yeah, when we get money, when money we've borrowed to perform a particular very useful function, it's diverted to some other place. If you look right. at the standard today, you realize we spent 42, 40 million Kenya shillings to lease ambulances, 10 of them. When the average cost of buying those ambulances is 42 million, you buy them and then you own them as the government. Mm. But we spent 40 million to lease. You realize we spent about 4 million Kenya shillings on snacks, mandazi and chai. That is the kind of mediocrity we have around here. Mm -hmm. And then you expect to make progress. We cannot. And we keep on pretending things are okay and they're not. So that is why we in, in some kind of rat race. Yeah. Yeah. We we'll never make, until we admit we have issues and we get, I ac actually expect Kenyans to get angry. Mm -hmm. If you're not angry enough, then you're not even a patriot. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Wow. Hey, still on here uh, with, with uh, Kenya and Kenyan news this week. Now, um, land linked to uh, Deputy President William Ruto has allegedly been repossessed by government. On Wednesday, the April the 22nd, the government moved to repossess land in Ruai that is allegedly linked to Deputy President William Ruto and former Lugari MP Cyrus Girongo. Mm, again, <laughs> that is basically witch hunt because, okay, it's possible the land was grabbed. That is way back when these guys were very strong in the Moy government. Mm -hmm. But if you travel back to the 1960s, that is where the rain began beating us. Mm -hmm. That is where we began the whole idea of grabbing land. If you go to the coast, you'll find some families with more than 100,000 acres, 100 acres of land. So we still go, need to go back there and get all that land back. And then we get to those guys who don't have land and give it to them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we need to be fair. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, also still on Kenya and our politicians, Sonko now blames his miseries on links with Ruto. Um, Nairobi Governor Mike Sonko appears to be blaming his woes on his association with Deputy President William Ruto. Sonko questioned why he has been branded a sympathizer with Tanga Tanga, a jubilee faction allied to the DP soon after he met Ruto. Two days later, his security details and drivers were withdrawn. The city boss met the DP at his current home in Nairobi last week, just a few hours before threatening to withdraw the deed of transfer agreement he signed with the national government. First of all, I'm kind of irritated that politicians are sort of back, <laughs> like talking about politics when we've not addressed Come the most virus. pending yeah. issue right now. So I'm just like, hmm. yeah, and that is why I said we have a lack of leadership. I expect the president to raise to the occasion at this moment and give leadership. A few days ago, there was a Tuoli, there was a Murade and uh, the former prime minister traveling all the way to a Tuoli's place in Isinia to discuss how they're going to form a unit government. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, at some point, there was a lot of noise about the Jubilee, uh, Jubilee Party officials being changed and stuff like that in the middle of this crisis. In the middle of this crisis. You see, when people we, we don't have food and they don't have jobs. And yeah, incomes. so I expect Kenyans to get very angry. Some of these guys have been around for so long, they're above 70 years old, and they don't care about another person, just about their selfish, narrow political interests. Mm. So the president has to rise up and tell them to shut up. In fact, if you talk about politics at the moment, the president, if, if you hold a position, 
that is appointed. You need to be sent away. Mm. It's, not the right, it's not the right time. And on Sonko, uh, you know, he signed the deed of transfer functions to the national government, which yeah. was done, I think, out of uh, the willingness to allow Nairobi to be run by both the county government and the national government. Of course, it's a big, big county mm -hmm. and it's the seat of the national government, of course. But then I think the process of implementation has not been done well because mm -hmm. uh, they began doing the whole thing without him. At mm -hmm. some point, they actually gave letters of secondment to 6,000 count employees without even giving him a phone call. Hey, we issued letters to so and so. So those guys were taken away from the county to the NMS. That's the uh, Nairobi Metropo Metropolitan Service. Mm -hmm. Then again, after a short while, 800 more workers were transferred again without his. Uh, you know, involvement. Mm -hmm. So I think what he's trying to say is, in as much as I signed the document, I'd like us to do uh, the process of... Like I'm still governor. <laughs> yes, yeah. let's just have me involved. Yeah. Some degree of respect. Okay. Yeah, and I don't think that is too much to ask. Okay. Yeah. Well, <laughs> public officers now face a six-month jail term for laxity in the new in a new bill. The proposed law requires independent commissions and officers to swiftly act on parliamentary recommendations and submit a report on the status of implementation. Public officers who fail to act on or inordinately delay to implement parliamentary reports or resolutions risk six months in jail or 500,000 shillings as a fine or both if a new bill becomes law. The bill is sponsored by ODM-nominated Senator Agnes Zani seeking to tame the laxity among officials who do nothing as parliamentary reports gather dust in government offices. It's yet to be tabled in the Senate for first reading. Again, <laughs> the fact that we even need such a bill, like, I don't know. It's just, it's embarrassing. Yeah, but again, that is again, it goes back to leadership. You know, Parliament sits down, they come up with the uh, reports and all that, they make recommendations, but then they're not implemented. Mm -hmm. So I think that is going to help because if it's not implemented and you're supposed to be doing that, sure. there should be punishment. Maybe yeah. that can motivate you into taking action. But why wasn't there punishment anyways? Like, because these people report to someone. They, I mean, the, the whole point is that people are accountable to someone else. So... All of the people who are in that system, mm. whether you are the one who is directly to implement it or you are the one to supervise, why weren't they doing their job? And why wasn't there any sort of recourse w up to now? W we have a culture of uh, funding commissions and reports are made and then they're just, you know, put somewhere and forgotten. The only time we had uh, some decent implementation of recommendations from reports when Kibaki was president. During Moi's time, nothing happened. Kenya's time, of course, you know, it was just about theft and, uh, you know, uh, politics. And more is time, of course, same thing. So and Uru's time, nothing has happened so far. So I think that the, the law is going to, it can help. That is if it's, uh, of course, if passed it's by implemented. the Senate. Yeah. <laughs> so it needs to be implemented so that all the other things can be implemented. Yeah. What so. a, what a, oh my goodness. Mm. Wow. What a situation. Um, Anyway, uh, President Uhuru Kenyatta, of course, extended the dusk to dawn curfew as well. Uh, travel restrictions now by 21 days. Uh, that was on Saturday, um, as well as the ban on movement in and out of the Nairobi metropolitan area and the counties of Kilifi, Kwale and Mombasa. President Kenyatta, while speaking, uh, addressing the nation at State House in Nairobi, announced these as part of a raft of new measures aimed at combating the spread of the virus. And of course, there's been a lot of conversations about about this like you know s different scenarios people are pointing at like if we had gone into a full lockdown would that have been a proper thing to do would it have helped us you know as painful as it would have been then would we not have to now keep extending this or hopefully we don't have to extend it again or should this move have come even earlier what are you, what's your take uh, of course we got it wrong at first but then at some point I think we got it right uh, the whole idea of uh, uh, a plane full of the Chinese landing at ZKIA when other parts of the world had blocked that kind of travel was a mistake. Um, that is a mistake, of course, on the Ministry of Transport and Interior, which handles immigration. That was a big, big mistake. Although some do argue that because even our first patient was not one of those nationals, um, but a student from the U.S., a Kenyan student from the U.S. Now, that is the argument you can make. But then again, you know, um, there is what you call asymptomatic, you know, outcomes. Like me and you could be having it, but then, you know, you recover without necessarily. Uh, I'll tell you there's so many Kenyans, especially young Kenyans, who, are, who actually contracted the virus and recovered without the government knowing because our 
testing is crappy. Mm -hmm. So we cannot claim that, that that was the first, you know, like patient. Okay. And then of course there was so much confusion about patient number one. Yeah. Then, yeah. So um, the extension of the lockdown is okay. But what we need to do is to make it robust by making sure the testing is okay. Yeah, and, and not opening restaurants. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and then <laughs> we, we should be able to uh, test, I mean, uh, trace contacts accordingly yeah. so that we stop the transmission. Okay. And of course, we make sure we pay for the Kenyans who want to commit suicide because they cannot afford quarantine fees. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm going to come back to, to that topic and uh, just uh, touch on your feedback for a little bit here. But I want us to, you know, travel across borders just a little bit uh, and look at the United States. Their total cases, um, this is according to the CDC, okay? Yeah. Um, cases in the U.S., total cases now, 1 million plus, 1 million, uh, 5,147 to be exact. And total deaths now are at 57,000. 505. Now, compared to yesterday's data, that's um, 2,247 new deaths and 23,901 new cases. cases. Uh, really, really intense there, as you can see. And um, this map here is showing COVID cases and deaths reported by states. Um, 19 states report more than 10,000 cases of COVID-19. I mean, the situation in the U.S. is, is pretty yeah, it's pretty uh, intense, right? Uh, um, nonetheless, though, they're also taking measures to start trying to reopen their economy. But w the reason I'm showing you this is because I, I appreciate that they actually have very up-to-date uh, statistics and yeah. information, which is something I think we as Kenya could learn from. It would be nice yeah. for all of us to be able to access this information to this detail and at this level. Um, I wonder how, you know, if we even fully have all the right information here in Kenya sometimes. But um, this is showing you the number of COVID cases and this sort of timeline. And you can see how that sort of exponential curve there has really um, been escalating. It's it's dipped a little bit, I guess, in the last few days, which is good. Yeah. Um, but certainly they have uh, a lot of information here um, uh, for people to follow. It would be nice if, if Kenya actually had something like this. Also just to dispel a lot of the stigma that we're now seeing coming out of this, right? Um, that's another issue that we're going to have to yeah. address. Um, but uh, before we wrap up this, I want to turn to some of your feedback and your comments. Um, someone here says, hey Joyce, good morning. I love your show. I'm watching from Raqqa. I would really like you to, I'm not sure, there's a word missing, I think. Something, the number of women who made DIY tins. You did the show a while ago. Oh, um, okay. Let me see if my producers, uh, Carol and Yambura, can remember the name and then we can give you the social media handles. Um, uh, another here says, Mi misioni tofauti ya restaurants na churches. Kama zina funguliwa, zifunguliwe zote. Na kama kufungua hata makanisa pia ziru husiwe waumini kuingia. Okay. Of course, they will observe all the rules and one meter distance. Come to think of it, bado watu wanakula vibanda sikuizi na hazijafungwa. That's Iman James watching from Mombasa. And that's the thing. Yesterday I heard someone saying, if you're going to open restaurants, be fair to other people as well. Yeah. <laughs> and allow them to open their own things as well. Mm, opening churches now, do you think there's a way to do that? It if we're slowly be, opening the economy? It would be very tough to open restaurants and then you don't allow churches to operate. So I, I think... But then again, in a restaurant, of course, you can limit the number of customers who come yeah. in, but you cannot limit the number of people getting into a church. Into a church, yeah. exactly. Yeah, but the good thing is they just need to just stop, the, to extend the whole idea of opening to some other time, not now. I'm with you, man. Yeah. I, I don't know. But uh, Emily from Comarock also seems to agree with us. And she says, I really think that was a premature move. And I don't think that the country is out of danger just yet. So Kenyans should maintain their guard against COVID-19 and not just relax because some sectors have been reopened. And it's very true. Yeah. You know, actually, I've been seeing some traffic on the roads when I get here in the mornings. And I'm like, hmm. Mm. So I don't know. Do you feel like Kenyans are starting to get laxed? Is this yeah, they feel like we're out of quarantine the road, but... fatigue? I, no, I j just think they think we're out of danger, which is possible, because okay. I think uh, maybe God decided to be merciful to us because yes. we don't have the ability to do anything. Because, again, if the disease was out there in, large, in, in a big way, you could be seeing more people dying, and yeah. we are not seeing that. Wow. Yeah. 
Anshari, thank you very much for joining me here on thank the show you. today. It's been great uh, discussing some of these issues with you. And guys, you can keep the conversation going on social media with us at Switch TV KE on Instagram at Switch TV Kenya on Facebook and Twitter. And of course, on our SMS line, double two triple nine. We do appreciate you once again. Thank and with you. that said, we're going to take a break as we get ready for our final segment for the day. I think we need something nice and entertaining, <laughs> something that's going to get our minds off of Corona for just a little bit. OK, so we'll be talking to an artist and he'll be sharing some of his work with us here on the show. Stay tuned. <laughs>